السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today we're going to summarize activities one and two of chapter one, transformation of food or digestion. Starting with chapter one, activity one. First of all, food is classified into six groups, as we see here: carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins, water, and mineral salts. Carbohydrates can be found in several foods such as uh, wheat, bread, rice, flour, uh, sugars, chocolate, uh, etc. And they are good and fast source of energy. Proteins, on the other hand, can be found, first of all, uh, in animal sources or plant sources. Uh, in animal sources such, such as meat, uh, beef meat, chicken meat, fish, uh, eggs, etc. And plant sources like uh, legumes and beans. Uh, they are important for growth and for other things like repair of cells if a cell is damaged or so uh, for production of other pro body proteins like hormones enzymes uh, antibodies etc third group is lipids we can see we can find lipids in vegetable uh, oils like olive oil corn oil etc and in other uh, sources like uh, fish uh, cheese butter etc Lipids are also a very important source of energy and they have a lot of uses such as they are important for giving us a healthy skin and hair. The fourth group are vitamins. Now vitamins, we can find them in fruits, vegetables, some types of fish. There are some types of vitamins. Of course, vitamins have many types. They are not only one type of vitamin. And in general, all vitamins are important for our healthy growth and development. Not any growth, healthy growth, away from diseases and being sick all the time. Vitamins are very important to our health. Now the water, of course, if we need water, we have to get it from water, drinking water, or eating other uh, food that are rich in water, such as fruits and vegetables. And uh, water uh, is important for all body functions. Uh, many body functions in our body do not happen if there was no water. And of course, we need to drink water in order to compensate our lost water in our body by sweating, urination, etc. Finally, we have the mineral salts. The mineral salts also is a big, a big group. There are many minerals such, uh, such as uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, iron, calcium, etc. And uh, these mineral salts can be found in various foods, uh, mainly, for example, in salt, uh, in some vegetables and fruits, in some uh, fish, for example, uh, other and other uh, sources. And like water, mineral salts are important for all body processes. They are important for our nervous system, for our muscular system, etc. Now. Another thing in activity one is about the food tests. We said that food has many types and groups. Now, if I want to know if a food sample, uh, what does it contain? What is its constituents? What do I do? There are things that we call food tests, which are tests done in the lab uh, using certain chemical reagents, chemical substances. They allow us to discover uh, the constituent of food to know what uh, are the components of this food sample. Now, there are many food tests, uh, but uh, you are concerned with only these four, which are uh, iodine test, biorit test, fehling test, and rub on a paper test. Now, if we start with iodine test, first, always we have what we call a positive result and a negative result. A positive result means there uh, is the substance that we are searching for. When it's a negative result, means that we couldn't find the substance that we are looking for. Uh, starting with iodine test, uh, it is a test done to uh, discover the presence of uh, starch in food. Now, in iodine test, if the positive result would be that the color of iodine, which is as we see here, uh, brown-orange, uh, will have to change to dark blue. If this happens, if we add iodine water to a certain food sample and the color of iodine changes to dark blue, this means that this food contains starch because as we said, the iodine test looks for starch. Now, well, if I put the iodine solution over a food sample and the color of iodine remains brown orange, so this is a negative result, this means that this food does not contain uh, uh, starch 
because it gave a negative result. The next test is BioID test. Now this test searches for uh, protein. It is a test done to uh, see if the food contains protein or not. In this test, we use two reagents, copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide. The copper sulfate is a blue solution, while the sodium hydroxide is a colorless solution. So we can consider that the BioRed test, the original color of this test is blue. Now, in the positive result, which, mean, which means if we have protein, the color, this blue color, has to change into violet. So it becomes a violet color. This means that this food has protein. Now, if the color of the violet test, which is blue now, okay, does not change to violet, it remains blue or changes to any other color, this means that the test is negative and that this food does not contain protein. The, th the last test is the Fehling test. The Fehling test is used to detect the presence of reducing sugar. So, uh, if uh, the reducing sugar, if the food contains reducing sugar, we call it a positive result. If it doesn't, we call it a negative result. Now, concerning the Fehling test, it's a bit different than other tests because it has to be heated. The setup of the uh, test has to be heated or else it will not give us a result. Let's see here, for example, we have a food sample here. We put it in a tube and we add to it some Fehling solution. As we notice, the Fehling solution is a blue solution. If the, the result is positive, we have to see brick red precipitate. We, have, we see uh, small uh, dots that are colored brick red, which is like the orange color. And uh, this means that this solution or this uh, food has reducing sugar in it. While if we make the test on another food sample and the color of the filling, which is blue, remains blue even after heating, then this food does not contain reducing sugar. Now, in this activity, we see a series of experiments done all on bread. Let us start with the first experiment. We can see that we have a piece of bread and we add to it some iodine solution. So, apparently, this is the iodine test. Now, as we see here, the color of iodine, which was brown-orange, becomes dark blue. The dark blue color is near to the black color, okay? This means that the, the bread contains starch. Okay, so we made iodine test, and we noticed that it gives, it, it gives dark blue color, so the bread is uh, rich in starch. The other experiment is actually the BioRed test, where they made this test on also a piece of bread. We noticed that the color of BioRed solution, which is blue, because we said the sodium hydroxide is uh, colorless, becomes uh, violet. When this happens, when the blue color changes to violet, this means that the bread contains proteins. Now, the third experiment, or the third document, we have here two experiments. The first experiment is done on a piece of bread crumb, a dry bread, okay? Now, uh, we put it inside a tube without anything added to it, just bread, and we heated it. We noticed that uh, directly we see droplets of water, small drops of water on the wall of that tube. This only means that this water came from the bread. It didn't come from nowhere, it, come, it came from the bread. So this means that bread contains what? It contains water. Even if it's dry, we notice that some water evaporated from it and condensed on the wall of the tube. The second experiment in this document is uh, an experiment done to search for the presence of salt. Now, there is a special chemical substance called silver nitrate. This substance, when it reacts, with salt, if it finds salt and react to it, which is uh, sodium chloride, the table salt, it will give as a product, it will give a white precipitate. So what did they do? Of course, they used the substance, but first, they put a piece of bread inside some distilled water, pure water. They used pure water because they don't want to find the salt in water. They want to find the salt in the bread. Mm -hmm. So they put distilled water in the tube and they shake the tube. Uh, well, then they added this substance that I talked about, which is silver nitrate. Directly, we see that there is a white precipitate of silver, silver chloride. This is the sign that uh, here we have salt. Now, as we said, there is no salt in the water, so apparently this salt came from where? It came from the bread. Yes. So now, 
from experiment one, we saw that there is starch. From experiment two, we saw that there is protein. And from experiment three, we know that bread contains water and salt. Now, experiment four, which is the rub on a paper test, we rubbed a piece of bread on a white paper and it gave a translucent spot. This translucent spot is a sign that bread contains lipids. So, from these experiments, we can conclude that bread is a complex food because it is made of more than one simple food. It contains starch, protein, water, mineral salts, lipids, etc. So we call bread a complex food. Now starting with activity two, which is titled chemical transformation of food. In this experiment, or in this, sorry, in this lesson, uh, we see that it starts with an experiment. Uh, as a step for answering the question, which is why do we taste, why do we feel a sweet taste if we chew our food, our, sorry, a piece of dry bread, uh, we chew it for a while and we feel that there is a sweet taste in our mouth. Where does this sweet taste come from? Of course, here we can put a hypothesis because we know that sweet taste comes from sugar, right? So we can put a hypothesis that uh, this bread starch in the bread which we chewed in our mouth changed to sugar okay now in order to test if this hypothesis is correct we made this experiment where we put two tubes a and b in both tubes there are cooked starch and only in tube a we added a small amount of fresh saliva both tubes are put inside a water bath at a temperature 37 degrees celsius now notice here we tried to make the conditions of the experiment similar to that in the body. That's why we call this experiment in vitro, which is an experiment done in the lab, but it has the same conditions of the body. Now, when after they made the setup, they made uh, two food tests, the iodine test and the fehling test. Now, the iodine test at T0, T0 means at the beginning of the experiment. They made the iodine test, uh, they got a dark blue color in both, Tubes, and that's obvious because obviously we may, we put the starch in the both in both tubes, and it has to give a positive result with iodine test. Now, with failing test, on the other hand, we made failing test on the two tubes, which searches for reducing sugar. We noticed that the blue color of failing didn't change; it remains blue. blue. This means that uh, here we don't have reducing sugar. Now, all this happens at T zero, which is at the beginning of the experiment. Then what did they do? They leave it to, for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, they made the iron test again, but this time they noticed a different result. Uh, tube A, which had starch with saliva, it gave a negative result with the iron test. That's so strange because at the beginning of the experiment, we added starch to the tube. At the end, after 15 minutes, we noticed that there is no starch. We can say, first that the starch disappeared but later on you are going to know where did it go well in tube b where there was only starch we noticed that it gives the same result also after 15 minutes it will still give blue dark blue color with iodine test this means that the starch is still there now when we made failing test after 15 minutes we noticed also that the results changed from the beginning of the experiment in tube a where I remind you again where there was a starch with saliva. I can I got a brick red precipitate in the tube, which is a positive result, which means that tube A contains now sugar. But wait a minute, there was no sugar at the beginning of the experiment. Where did this sugar come from? On the other hand, in tube B, where there was only starch alone, the failing also gave a negative negative result. The color of the tubes, uh, the, the, the color of the failing is still blue. So, going back to tube A, what is there special in tube A that made the sugar appear and the starch disappear? Here, we can say something very important, that the starch actually didn't disappear. Starch in tube A transformed, and the word transformed means it, it changed. It changed to what? It changed to sugar, and the, the evidence here is that uh, the failing test gave us a positive result. So here, the starch in tube A, where there was saliva, transformed into sugar. Here, from this experiment, we can go to a conclusion that says saliva 
helps in the transformation of starch into sugar. That's why when we chew our food, our sorry, our starch, uh, for example, the piece of bread, for a long time, for enough time in our mouth, we can feel a sweet taste which, com which comes from the sugar. Now, the, ex the important question is, what is there in saliva that made it uh, transform starch into sugar? What's so special in saliva? Actually, saliva, uh, which is produced in the mouth, the mouth, contains an enzyme, and now we are going to say what do you mean by enzyme, called salivary amylase. This enzyme facilitates the hydrolysis, also we're going to explain what we mean by hydrolysis, of the starch into sugar called maltose. Okay, so saliva contains an enzyme that facilitates, helps the hydrolysis of starch into sugar. You have this figure in your book where we have the chain of starch. When it's mixed with saliva in the mouth, it gives maltose, which as we see are shorter chains from the starch. And maltose is the sugar. Now, What's the meaning first of hydrolysis? We can divide this word into two parts, hydro and lysis. Hydro means water and lysis means breakdown. And thus we can say that hydrolysis is the breakdown. First, it's a chemical reaction, of course, it's a process where there is a breakdown of complex molecules into simpler ones in the presence of water. And the key word here, presence of water. So we can paraphrase this by saying it's breaking down things by water, by the help of water. But the thing is here that this hydrolysis of food does not happen on its, own, on its own. It can't happen on its own. It's a very slow process. That's why it needs what we call an enzyme. Now, what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a chemical substance or a biocatalyst. And what do we mean by biocatalyst? A catalyst teacher is a chemical substance that speeds up reactions. It makes reactions fast. Now, biocatalyst it means a, a catalyst, but produced by the body, by certain glands in the body. So, an enzyme is a chemical substance called a biocatalyst that facilitates the transformation of food from complex molecules to simple ones. So, it facilitates, it's, it makes the hydrolysis, the breaking down, it makes it easier, faster. That's why enzymes are very important. If I want to explain more how the enzyme works, Let's say this is the enzyme amylase, and this is the starch. The enzyme amylase binds to the starch uh, chain, and it makes a complex as a key and lock complex, okay? And then it uh, makes the bonds between the maltose uh, chains break down. So it breaks down the bonds, and it changes the shape of the molecule, so we can get the product now, which is the maltose, the sugar. Notice how the enzyme doesn't change, okay? It stays as it is because it has to go and cut, break down other starch molecules. So the enzyme, the catalyst, is used over and over again. Thanks for your attention and goodbye.